Welcome to Building an Acquisition Pipeline, Serial Acquirer's Playbook for Success in a New Normal. This session is presented by Plunkett Cooney and UHY Advisors Corporate Finance. Let's meet our panelists. Casey Asgar, President and Chairman, Asgar Brands. Alex DeBartolomeo, Manager at UHY Advisors. And moderating today's session is Dennis Cowan, partner and co-leader of the Transactional Law Practice Group at Plunkett Cooney. Dennis, take it away. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. We are very pleased to uh, be part of the conference. Uh, we are going to talk today about building the acquisition pipeline. Uh, we've got a great panel along with me is Casey Asgar, uh, chairman of Asgar Brands and Alex uh, DiBartomeleo, who is a manager at UHY. Uh, I'm the uh, managing partner for our business transactional practice group. And for the last 36 years, I've been involved in a number of different transactions uh, involving buying and selling of companies and related real estate. Uh, my wheelhouse is really working with uh, governmental agencies and getting approvals for clients as I was the mayor of Royal Oak for about uh, 14 years. So uh, Casey, you want to talk a little bit about your background with respect to deals? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Dennis. And uh, for me, I, I've been uh, in business for, um, I think, just over 25 years now, uh, very heavily in the franchise world, uh, in the food sector, from franchisee to franchisor, uh, also food distribution and, and uh, various different aspects of the franchise world, from QSR to uh, full service. Uh, also, uh, in the petroleum sector as well, uh, everything from being a marketer of, of, uh, of uh, multi-brands uh, uh, like Marathon, Chevron, Sitco, Sunoco, uh, and then also in the distribution side of that. Uh, and then uh, commercial real estate, uh, everything from office to light industrial to uh, medical and, uh, and retail. Uh, so, uh, uh, a diverse family portfolio uh, of assets that we own, manage, uh, and uh, and we have a, a certain uh, unique aspect of our of our uh, business model from being a strategic uh, and uh, really acquisition M and A driven. Great, thank you very much. And uh, Alex, I know you got some great clients at U UHY, and what have you done with them on their deals? Yeah, thanks, Dennis, and thanks, Casey. Uh, so UHY, for those that are not, that, that are not familiar, is a uh, accounting, tax, uh, and consulting firm. You know, head, we've got headquarters kind of here in Michigan. We've got offices in St. Louis and, and in New York as well. And so, um, you know, our group, myself, uh, as well as a number of other professionals, the corporate finance group, help clients through acquisitions and divestitures. My, my experience and my service offering relates primarily to the financial due diligence component. A lot of people focus on uh, EBITDA and, and, and quality of earnings, as well as networking capital uh, kind of analyses. And that's, that's what we in this group offer as, as a service, as well as broader investment banking and uh, you know, capital acquisition uh, advisory services. Great. Well, the first thing we want to talk about a little bit is deal approach. So Casey, what is the criteria that you look at in evaluating a potential target? Yeah, so it's for us, um, uh, it depends on uh, what we're looking for. Are we looking for an acquisition that gives us synergy? Are we looking for an acquisition that gives us uh, more broader diversification in our portfolio? Uh, and so, uh, as we're looking um, uh, in, in that and what space uh, that we want to either expand or uh, diversify into, uh, we're looking for opportunity mainly. Uh, and uh, we're not um, uh, uh, an institutional type of a buyer, we're, we're, we're opportunity driven. So, um, we're looking for brand equity first and foremost. At what position does a certain uh, acquisition target have in its marketplace? Uh, we're looking at the team, the team structure. Uh, is this an acquisition that 
uh, fits in our wheelhouse where we have the infrastructure and, and the team to take over, or is this something that we have to assess the strength of the team that will need that? And uh, and typically, if, it's, if that's the case, the team, the, the strength of the team, uh, is our priority number one. Uh, if it's if it's uh, uh, an acquisition that relates to um, the importance of the, the team that's in place. Um, we look at, um, uh, when we're looking at opportunity, many times it's, an, it's, an, it's a potential acquisition that uh, may have challenges. So as it has challenges, is it, is it, a, uh, is it a U type of uh, uh, turnaround structure for us? Um, uh, is it a V type? Uh, we've had that. Uh, we've had both of those situations and in some cases uh, not so fortunate where is it an L type? Is it, does it bring value even if the, if the company continues just to trade sideways because of critical mass that it may bring in? So we, we look at all different ends of the spectrum of, of what makes sense for us. But um, most of all, I think we're looking at the opportunity uh, that we can create out of any form of investment, whatever sector it may be that, that we're in. Great. Uh, Alex, what about at UHY? What kind of criteria do you have you and your clients looking at? Yeah, so, you know, I think I think that really depends on the type of client here in our group. We, we uh, like to say that we're industry agnostic. And so, you know, really depending on the client and, and, and the acquisition or the divestiture, it is really kind of how we structure, you know, the different criteria. And we want to understand always from our client's point of view, what are they most concerned about? Um, you know, within a within our service line, there's there's standard things that you would do on on every project. But we always try and work with our clients up front to understand what are the key areas that you're focused on, and and what's really going to drive value for you in this deal, so that we can dive deep into that. Okay, so. Obviously, one thing on everybody's mind is uh, what is happening and how is COVID-19 and the pandemic impacting uh, acquisition funding and deal criteria. So in this, we're not even in the post-COVID world yet because we're still in the COVID world. Uh, but uh, Alex, could you comment on how that's affecting you and your clients and their approach on transactions? Absolutely. Yeah, so this is... Uh this is obviously the, the, the hot topic of, of the last few months and, and it's going to continue to be a hot topic because as you mentioned, uh, we're not out of, we're not out of COVID yet. And for the next two to three years, we're always going to be looking back at the COVID period to understand what happened. And I think it's important to understand when you're either you're looking at an acquisition target or you're, you're, you're selling your company, it's important to understand both the quantitative impacts as well as the qualitative impacts of, of what COVID has done to your business. We we often talk about business elasticity. I know Casey, you mentioned kind of the V or the U or the or the W or you know, a lot of times the flat. And so, really, what's important when we're looking at businesses now and what we're what we're helping our clients try and understand is business durability and business elasticity. And so it's really important to understand from our perspective, as well as a lot of our clients and lenders, you know, if, if the deals are being financed, lenders want to understand, is the business going to bounce back? And if so, when, or has it already bounced back? Or alternatively, there's a lot of situations where, you know, there, there are some businesses that have been very opportunistic during this time period and have either had different revenue streams come up or have been able to take advantage of, of some of the things that have popped up as a result of COVID. And so it's really important to understand if it's new, is it gonna continue? Or is it truly just kind of one time, uh, you know, within this period that we're looking at? And so I really think that, that the elasticity portion of, of what we're talking about in, in deals is important during this time period and will continue to be important as we, as we look back on this period. Right, Casey. Yeah, so for us, um, COVID really has not um, played a major role in our acquisition pipeline as of yet, only because we really haven't seen any um, uh, any real opportunities that have that have you know come across our desk as of yet. 
the challenges that we've seen in, with companies uh, are usually um, sectors that we really don't want to get into because uh, COVID is so impactful. Um, for us, I can tell you that uh, in the in the in the food space, the QSR space is doing very well. Quick service restaurants. So, if you have a delivery model type of uh, 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 operation, or if you have a, a drive-through component, uh, those have been uh, performing very well. And so, uh, in the you know in the M and I in the M and A space, there was really we haven't really seen any opportunities there. Where we've had some challenges is with our full service or in dining establishments. Those have really uh, uh, taken a beating, uh, and so uh, there are opportunities out there in that space, and which we're not really uh, interested in, in in going in. We're actually not really interested in going in that space. Period. Pre COVID, COVID just really um, uh, emphasized that. Um, but I believe that you know there are opportunities out there. Uh, if you're if you are willing to land bank opportunities, you know, kind of like a, in the real estate model of land banking, um, if you see uh, you know if there's a light at the end of the tunnel, because once things go back to normalcy, you'll see a lot of things start rebounding. You have staying power. Uh, do you have um, uh, do you have the capital to endure you know a long term cash burn if needed? Uh, do you have the type of lending relationships? Uh, we're not really seeing uh, conventional lending out there right now as, uh, as uh, strongly as we did pre-COVID, uh, but there is some you know, creative type of lending. Um, you know, for us, we have our own internal, you know, from you know from warehouse line access and, and whatnot. Uh, and there are some situations where we're willing to um, uh, utilize our own cash just because we see the value. Uh, but as far as um, uh, what COVID has done today, I think that um, you'll see opportunities start coming around probably, I would assume, uh, 2021, uh, perhaps sometime after Q1, uh, you'll start seeing right now with all the PPP money and so forth, uh, people are still kind of holding on. Um, uh, in, the, in the business side of things that we're into, on the real estate side of things, uh, some things are starting to uh, soften up, and so we are seeing some opportunities out there, but we really haven't um, moved in uh, yet aggressively on uh, uh, the acquisition. Right. Uh, I think with uh, our clients, uh, we've seen a deeper dive uh, as they're looking at a target uh, or potential acquisition, uh, particularly how did the business respond to COVID, and then we're going to go through probably a couple more levels with COVID, uh, hopefully ending with a vaccine uh, uh, stage where uh, we'll, we'll find a cure, so to speak, or, or delay. Uh, and then, so how is the business go functioning through all these different phases? And then what's the long-term prognosis? So I think we're seeing a little bit more of a deeper dive. And then we all have to be prepared. We can't uh, let COVID just clutter our thinking. Uh, we've also got the, the normal business issues that come up, such as we have an election coming up, and how is that going to impact the economy and a potential change in administration or uh, the Trump administration continuing? So all those other business factors still come into place, and COVID just becomes one of them. So uh, I thank you for your, uh, for your insight on that. So we all have deals that there's challenges in getting deals done. And I think the first issue that, that comes up is uh, how emotions uh, play part of the deal. Uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, buyers and sellers and everybody thinks they have the best company in the world to sell and the highest price. And, 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 you know, people are looking as you, Casey, for opportunity, which means a little bit lower price. So, uh, well, how do you, how do you take the, uh, Casey, when you look at a, a situation, how do you take the emotion uh, out of a transaction? Yes, I think it depends on um, where is it and, and what size of uh, transaction we're, we're talking about. You know, if, if it's a if it's a privately held company, it's more of a found, you're dealing with a founder with a family. Uh, you're definitely going to have more emotion involved, and uh, you know, so there's a um, there's a bit of um, handholding in the process that has to take place to 
make them, you know, uh, get comfortable and make sure that they are uh, happy with their exit strategy and so forth and uh, and what plans they have and how this benefits them. And, and um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're dealing with more of an institutional where you're dealing with hired guns that are, that are handling the transactions, a different, totally different type of psyche, it's a totally different type of negotiation, negotiation structure. Um, and, but we typically, obviously on our end, uh, you know, this is what we do for a living. So when you're, you know, when you've got the experience, when you season, emotion really doesn't play a major role. Everything is based off of data, you know, um, you know, analytics, what, what, what type of trajectory this company has, you know, what, um, how scalable is this company? Uh, and when you're negotiating, as long as you're bringing uh, a backup to your valuation and, and and your structure, it's pretty hard to contest that no matter what. And, when, and once you get the emotional side out of it, in some cases, um, then you know then you can come to reason to you know reality. Um, in some cases, that is challenging, but we try to we try to push that out away and and uh, stick to business. A lot of times, it takes a while to get someone to really grasp the you know the real value of their of their company uh it's no different than an emotional seller of anything you know you, you can have a home that's worth a half a million bucks but you want a million dollars for it but when you get three different third-party appraisals that say it's a half a million dollars eventually you've got to realize that you're either a real seller and the price tag is somewhere in the half a million dollar range plus or minus depending on any moving you know variables or you really, you're really not a seller. And once you get people there, um, then you can really start moving forward. Right. Alex? Yeah, absolutely, Casey. You make some great points. And I think, you know, sometimes as service professionals, you know, advising the client, it's a little bit easier for, for us to remove our emotion from the process because ultimately, uh, you know, the, the deal, it, means a lot more to the client that's going to be adding on a company or selling their company. You know, we work with, we work with a lot of business owners who, as you mentioned, may think that their, their business is worth, you know, a million dollars when in fact the, the, you know, their EBITDA and, and their multiples that they're looking at may be inflated because they're, they're comparing their company to a Google or, or comparing their company to, you know, a, a much bigger organization. And so, I think, you know, our role, part of our role in the process is to help manage those those expectations. And, and really, if you're on, if you're looking to divest a portion of a business or if you're looking to sell your business, it's important early on to understand kind of your financial health and understand where your EBITDA actually is from a, from a normalized perspective, as well as understand where your business is trading in terms of multiples, because the worst thing that could happen is you enter into a transaction, you go through an entire process with buyers and you get left at the end saying, you know, I thought my business was worth X and you're only offering me Y, which is a lot lower. And so, you know, there are a lot of sellers out there right now who are also getting approached and, and it's really important to understand whether those are serious buyers and, and good buyers or they're, they're want to take you down a process to, to just dr drag you down a process and say at the end, add a bunch of language or a bunch of um, items at the end to kind of limit the value of the deal. And, you know, alternatively on this, on the buy side, again, it's going back and looking sh at the, at the business and really making sure you understand, you know, kind of how, how that company has been trading and, and, and making sure that you understand clearly from the get go, how that company is going to fit into your, into your portfolio of businesses, because, you know, given how things are right now, it, there's there's opportunity, but people should be cautious about how they're approaching those opportunities and making sure they truly understand the businesses. And, and a lot of times if you're if you're being a little, um, you know, aggressive, that that emotion can get a lot, uh, you know, can be a lot more of an impact on the, on the overall process. Thanks. You know, generally, uh, I always say keep the person with the emotion out of the negotiations, but that isn't always possible. Uh, so as a result, uh, I cut a deal with uh, recently with a two-on-two -two negotiation with a CEO I was working with uh, who is uh, emotional about the deal, about the acquisition. Uh, I said, okay, we're going to do good cop, bad cop. So you're the, you're the bad cop and I'm the good cop. So fortunately, it was a pre-COVID and 
we were we were in a conference room with other places to go and get coffee or a, a, a coke or whatever and be able to uh, patch things back together as as the negotiations went through the ups and downs that they always do. So that's one possible approach when you can't get the emotional person out of it you can use it to your advantage and do the good cop, bad cop routine. So it's just a thought uh, uh, that you, you may be able to utilize. So we always talk about the, the best deal being maybe the one we walked away from, uh, but also deals where things went sideways, where you look back and say, geez, I just wish I had done a little bit more to make this thing happen. So Alex, can you, uh, in your experience, is there a deal maybe that uh, went a little sideways that, you could have been prevented and what would you have done? Yeah. So I think again, a lot of times it's, I, th I think the anecdote or, uh, of the more you prepare for something, the better that whole process is going to go and, and a deal or an M and a transaction is no different. And so a lot of times we'll be brought in late in the process with our clients. And, you know, sometimes that can be detrimental because they they've already gone down this road of, of, wanting to do something and they may not have had enough time or different circumstances really kind of amount to, you know, the situation at, at hand, but really it, it, the, the more you plan and the more you can get advisors, if you are, are a non-sophisticated buyer or seller involved in the process early, uh, you know, that's always beneficial because again, you don't want to be halfway through the process or at the end of the process and be caught flat footed. And, and, and that's really, you know, that, that's really important to try and avoid those things. And typically the deals that we see go sideways are a result of that. Okay. Casey, uh, anything about deals that got away? Yeah, I, I think for us, um, uh, as years have went by, we've probably walked away from more deals than uh, that we've moved forward on. You know, you know, you you reach a certain point where you you know you you can't be a deal junkie. You've got to be able to walk away. But uh, I would say that um, going back to the emotions, we have had one that comes to mind for me, uh, a deal where the seller uh, was very emotional, and uh, we just couldn't reach uh, you know a zopa zone of, of possible agreement, and so we ended up walking away from it. But we, I always like to value make sure that i that i'm valuing the opportunity from it without having to pay for that opportunity that i create right so um you don't want to pay for what for what you create but sometimes you do have to uh put some value on, uh to that if you want to get the deal done so uh somewhat short-sightedness of saying this deal doesn't um you know pan out on, on its own and you want to make sure that each deal is, in, you know, can, can stand on its own merit. Uh, but at times we do have to think about what type of value that brings to the overall company, to the overall structure. Uh, and in, in this case, um, we we did let the seller's emotion play too big of a role, where we couldn't com compromise and reach, uh, you know, uh, uh, a fair agreement. Uh, and uh, so we did walk away from it. And uh, had we went forward on that, it really would have been very impactful for the growth forward of the company. Well, good. Yeah, you know, I think we'd all agree that uh, even in this uh, uh, world that we live in today with all the uh, various unknowns, a deal still got to make the right financial sense for the company. And if it doesn't, that's a deal you got to walk away from. So uh, kudos to you on, on being able to do that. And, uh, and uh, I guess the more, well, once you've walked away from one, you can walk away from many, but at the end of the day, it's got to be the right strategy uh, for the company and for the client. So Casey, what about the, the best deal you ever did and why? Yeah. So for me, um, for me, really, there is no one best deal. For me, the best deal is a deal that uh, takes you to a whole new uh, level that, you know, that creates a new platform, uh, whether it's, from a scale perspective, where you're going from uh, a certain size to, you know, to, a, uh, to a much larger size, or whether it's a deal that's getting you into a whole new space, whole new sector that creates opportunity. So, I would say for me, uh, the first pizzeria that I that I ever purchased as a franchisee uh, was very successful, and had that not been so successful. 
I may not have uh, expanded uh, as a franchisee. Then the biggest best deal that I've done in that space was an, a franchisor acquisition opportunity where now I went from franchisee to franchisor and I've been able to scale that organically and, and through uh, acquisitions to where it's at now. Uh, same thing in the petroleum space, that entry level deal that got a foot through the door in that space where that, that, that was, um, uh, you know, what propelled us to scaling that, you know, in, in that in that sector, and it's all it's not all it's not only in business. Um, to me, I look at that also from a personal perspective. Um, it could be the um, you know the family side of things of of uh, making a decision, a commitment that really doesn't give a, a monetary ROI, but a from a family perspective, if you're looking at a succession play. Um, if, you, if, you're, if your model is more of a dynastic type of model where you may be acquiring something that bleeds a lot of money, but it's for the big picture for the greater good. So it could be a property, you know, uh, an estate that is for the, for the future of the family that takes you to a whole new level as well. Uh, but I would say for me, and the biggest thing is whatever launches to a new space or to scale the space that we're in. Uh, and that um, I would, you know, I would say our first uh, acquisition in the franchisor world, uh, our first acquisition in the commercial real estate world. It wasn't that long ago after the um, the subprime uh, collapse, where we acquired our first professional office building in Bingham Farms, and now it's grown grown that into millions of square feet because of that one acquisition that got us into that space. Um, but there are quite a few. There isn't just one, but there is one specific to each space in our portfolio that's gotten us to scale scalability. Okay. Alex? Yeah, so it, again, as a service professional, we have right. the, the, the benefit of a lot, seeing a lot of different deals, both every month, every year. And so, you know, no, no one particular deal stands out uh, to me as, as the best deal. I think that we're very fortunate here at UHY to be able to work with a lot of great clients and, and a lot of great targets. And, you know, at the end of the day, acquisitions, M&A in general is, is very fast paced and it can be very, you know, emotional as we've, as we've kind of talked about. And at the end of the day, some of the best deals that I can think of are where everyone's in the same room trying to get to the right answer in, in, it's really just kind of about the the, the qualitative aspect of, of working with good people and, and the ones where we're working with good people and there's there's good communication uh those are the ones that stick out in my mind as, as the best deals and you know again we, we're all professionals and we all everything needs to make financial sense but at the end of the day you know i think the, the human interaction especially especially nowadays with a, a remote world um it, right. it is important so uh you know, the best deal sometimes is the one you walk away from. I don't mind sharing a story where uh, we had several doctors involved in a potential uh, surgical center deal. And uh, I, I never liked the deal, but uh, we kept on plugging forward. And finally, uh, we, uh, the, the client decided, clients decided to walk away. Uh, I had advised them that there was just something that, that wasn't right with this particular deal. And sure enough, two weeks later, showing up on my screen as a lawsuit filed in local circuit court with the other side, other partners in the deal fighting among one another. Uh, and so uh, maybe that was the deal. They, uh, we, they, they, they actually thanked me for the walk away <laughs> and, and pursuing that. Uh, but no, I think the best deal, Alex, you're correct. And, and Casey, I know you've worked with a lot of service professionals. It's the, the best deal is the one where the client's uh, happy about the deal. Well, when it's all over and they're uh, set and equipped uh, to move forward and either take it to the next level or expand, 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 expand their platform. Uh, those are the deals where they're the best deal at the end of the day. So, so kind of to wrap things up uh, with respect to our, uh, uh, you know, de uh, working with deals and our approach and challenges. Uh, K uh, Casey, any final thoughts? Uh, key takeaways or best practices uh, you'd like to tell our, uh, the folks who are looking in with us today here at the Detroit uh, Deal Makers Conference? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, 
understand what your model is and, and uh, what you're looking to accomplish. Are you are you a private equity model? Are you more of a strategic? Uh, are you looking for um, you know short turn, short run type of acquisitions? Are you looking for more long term, you know, dynastic type of acquisitions, which is what we concentrate on on our end. Uh, and uh, I mean, you got to touch up on it. The best deals really are deals where you can create a win-win situation. Uh, relationships matter. And uh, um, the best deals that I've ever done are when both sides won. And uh, number one, you feel leaving good, you did the right thing. A lot of times uh, that comes back to you uh, as well. And uh, remember this, when you're doing deals, it's it's what I've learned in, in my experience in doing this for over 25 years is it's not always about getting the best deal getting the best price so when being a good negotiator if, if you really um, have your own style but your own part of the deal uh it's not about hey i, I, I crushed it I, I i got the best price possible uh it's about structuring the the best deal possible uh where they can exit uh, in a good place, and your position to uh, now to be able to create the opportunity that you're able to create. So sometimes we can be short-sighted and look at the smallest price tag, or we can create a value structure in a certain way where both parties win, and you have now the flexibility, the flexibility, um, uh, uh, access to uh, capital and resources because of the way that you structured it where now you can actually uh, create real value and real scalability. Uh, so it's not always about, um, you know, um, getting, you know, getting off on the, on the best deal. It's about how you can create the best value. And a lot of times in my experience, is what you when that able to be created for both sides. Okay. Alex. Absolutely. You know, echoing, echoing the comments, I think that, that, uh, you know, we've all kind of talked about here is, is that, you know, the, the best transactions are the ones where there's a win-win scenario for both people. And, and, you know, a lot of times from our, from our perspective as service providers, it's the ones that we can get in and, and help our clients understand what their objectives are and what their goals are in terms of how they're going to be, uh, you know, acquiring or, or, or divesting in a lot of cases. But, um, you know, it's really important to understand your objective going in and understanding the key value drivers of a company or, or an owner that you're looking to acquire. And just having us really focus in on those and, and make sure that we understand those. And then, you know, for those that are selling and those that are buying, buying you know, it's, an, it's important to understand your financial health and, and where you're at. And I know we talked about that a little bit before, but, you know, you don't want to show up you go to the doctor every year to understand your, your health and, and your, your checkup there. And so it's important to be either doing it internally or working with external advisors to understand financial health um, of, of both your company, if, you, if you're looking to acquire or sell and um, understand the, the health of the companies that you're looking to acquire. Right. Uh, for our part, you know, being lawyers, uh, I always like to emphasize follow through on that due diligence in, in an acquisition. Sometimes you get deal weary and you kind of look the other way and say, ah, we don't have to really look into that too deep. Uh, and then it comes back to bite you. Uh, recently, I was involved uh, in two situations where we were not involved in the acquisition, but the clients uh, did not do a thorough due diligence on the real estate involved in the underlying transaction found out that in both instances, they were non-conforming uses. Uh, one, there had been a rezoning that they weren't aware of, and it caused a lot of problems. Uh, we had to be brought in to negotiate with the local municipality. So it doesn't hurt, especially if you got a real estate-based, uh, or real estate-involved transaction, uh, to get down to local city hall, township hall, and just kind of nose around a little bit, talk, understand, uh, how the community views the particular property, uh, especially if it's a industrial property, and make sure that it is properly zoned uh, and follow through on that due diligence because it became a very expensive proposition in both these instances, which could have been avoided if there had been a little bit more work. So just 
you know, keep with it. Don't get deal weary. Fight that deal weariness uh, and make good things happen for uh, for yourself and for your company. So uh, I want to thank uh, Casey and Alex uh, for your input. I want to thank all of those who uh, uh, looked in today and we look forward to your questions.